very, very warm welcome to all our speakers and uh, the audience uh, who are joining this session and who are joining the Sankalp Global Summit. Um, this is probably one of the most global sessions uh, we've had all day where we have uh, our speakers joining in all the way from Seattle to Seoul. And um, uh, really, really thankful and grateful to you all for taking out the time. Uh, and uh, I uh, am Prachi. I represent the energy and uh, climate change practice at IntelliCap. And I will be your host for the session. Uh, I would also like to just lay down the agenda for the discussion on the post-pandemic rural transformation, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship for smart rural areas. Um, the, uh, we are joined by a, a great uh, uh, lineup of, of panelists, and I will uh, be soon inviting our moderator, uh, Ms. Tara Sharifuddin from World Bank, to introduce herself and the panelists and also take the discussion forward. But uh, just before that, uh, uh, I would like to lay down the agenda uh, and also some housekeeping rules. Uh, we will be starting the session with a round of introductions and also going into a panel discussion of about uh, uh, 50 to four minutes or so, where we are basically discussing about the different approaches adopted by governments, uh, both in India uh, and outside of India, uh, towards integrated rural development. And uh, the first half of the session, we'll hear more from uh, uh, governments, development organizations, and financiers. And in the second half of the uh, conversation, we would hear more from the private sector players uh, as to how they have uh, uh, managed to scale their solutions and how they're looking at rural markets currently and uh, going forward. And the last 15 minutes of the session will be open to the audience for uh, any questions that you want to pose uh, to our speakers. And uh, these, will, uh, these can be put into the chat window, which we'll be sharing with our moderator. So uh, without uh, further ado, I uh, would like to call upon uh, Ms. Tara Sharafuddin, who's a Senior Social Development Specialist at the World Bank to introduce herself and our eminent speakers. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prachi. Uh, greetings, everyone, and a very warm welcome from Washington, DC to this session titled Post-Pandemic Rural Transformation, Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship for Smart Rural Areas. Um, I, I mean, I, as Prachi mentioned, I'm at the World Bank, uh, but my field experience of rural development comes from my stint as an officer of the Indian Administrative Service, the Civil Service of India. Uh, my special focus is on technology and innovation for local economic development. And as Prachi mentioned, I'm moderating the session. The current pandemic has raised calls uh, for building back better, especially in relation to the environment. But it also offers an opportunity for us to rethink rural spaces, um, which continue globally to lag behind in terms of access to infrastructure and services and to economic opportunities to build a back better in a smarter approach to rural development that helps to bridge the gap uh, between rural and uh, more developed urban areas in terms of services and employment. Um, we feel that using technology and innovation to, we would result in more connected and resilient rural areas, areas that are better able to withstand external shocks, including pandemic and preserve lives and livelihoods. Uh, today we have with us a very distinguished and very experienced panel who I know personally have a deep passion and commitment to rural development. So this promises to be a very exciting session. As Prachi mentioned, we really span the globe. It's a truly a global conversation. Uh, I have great pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished panel, starting with uh, Alka Upadhyay. Upay Dhyaya, who is the additional secretary, Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India, a very distinguished officer of the Indian Administrative Service. She joins us from Delhi. The ministry has some of the world's largest global programs related to rural infrastructure and livelihoods. Uh, welcome, uh, Alkaji. And next in Geneva, uh, from the International Telecommunications Union, we have Hani Iskandar, uh, who is 
uh, senior coordinator digital services and also is in charge of ITU's partnership with the government of Niger for the Niger Smart Villages project. Welcome, Hani. And representing a very important element, the impact investment community, we have Noshir Kola, partner at Avishkar Capital, a pioneer in venture capital for early stage growth companies that focuses on rural areas and challenging geographies and sectors. Welcome, uh, Noshir. We have joining us from, uh, from Seattle, the first of our private sector panelists, uh, Mr. Prashant Shukla, Managing Director, Udemy, uh, for India and South Asia. Udemy is the world, one of the world's largest online skill development platforms, uh, offering 100,000 courses for to over 37 million users in 65 different languages. Uh, welcome, Prashant. We also look forward to hearing of your experience as National Technology Officer India for Microsoft, where you helped to develop Harisal as the first digital village in India. Then from the other end of the globe in Seoul, we have Jahu Ku, uh, who is Executive Director Overseas Business Development as Samsung SDS, uh, which is uh, the global software solutions and IT arm of the well-known Samsung Group, um, he, which, special, which specializes in cloud, data, AI, blockchain, network, and solutions. Uh, before that, Jahu was spent a had a long stint at Korea Telecom, where he has worked on very innovative ICT applications in rural areas in multiple countries. Welcome, Jahu, to the panel. And next, but last but not the least, from the lovely Himalayas in Dharamshala, which you can see behind him, we have Michael Gim Gold, uh, who is a director of strategy and operations and the co-founder of a very innovative social enterprise, Air Jaldi, which provides uh, affordable rural um, connectivity, digital connectivity, and is operating in seven states in India for the last decade. Welcome, uh, Michael, to the panel. Uh, this is it for the panel. And without much further ado, uh, let's just uh, jump in uh, into the discussion. Uh, as Prachi mentioned, the first uh, part of the discussion is looking at national approaches to smart rural development. I would like to start with the additional secretary, Ministry of Rural Development. Uh, Alka ji, how is the Indian government looking at smart rural development? How do you coordinate between different ministries and departments uh, to address the issues of infrastructure, uh, services, and employment in rural areas? Why is smart rural uh, transformation particularly important in a post-COVID-19 world what has been some of the innovative approaches that you've had in rural areas in India to the pandemic? Um, and what are areas where you think from a government perspective, smart interventions would be relevant? Um, could you also speak a little bit about the rural urban mission and the cluster-based approach to, to providing services and generating employment? Thank you. Over to you, Alkaji. So thank you very much and uh, really glad to be a part of this discussion and this panel and I look forward to a lot of learnings from whatever has been done across the world since we have a very distinguished panel over here. So uh, starting with uh, the Ministry of Rural Development, so needless to say we uh, at the Ministry of Rural Development are approaching this entire issue of poverty in two different uh, verticals. Number one is providing rural infrastructure and the second vertical is to augment the livelihoods and incomes of people in the rural areas. So all our programs are aligned towards these two uh, particular uh, dimensions of poverty. The, the issue that I would just like to flag over here is poverty as such 
is uh, not only uh, not only uh, in terms of households, but it also has a geographical meaning to it. So whenever we kind of uh, try to tackle poverty, it has to be a multidimensional approach. Uh, the multidimensional approach has to be focused both on communities and on people, on single individuals. So uh, for a long time, and since Paraji just mentioned that she's had a stint in the government as, uh, and has worked in the rural areas of the country, she would vouch for it that uh, we have been looking at this very, very astutely and individual beneficiary oriented schemes and uh, the poverty alleviation programs have all been changed over time. So one of the important shifts that we did is move away from the subsidy regime because whatever goes in a subsidy doesn't really turn around much. It has to be the uh, willingness and the will and the facilitating environment which creates a better dimension to this entire approach. And uh, when I say this, because the word that has been brought up is smart governance, smart villages, smart development across uh, clusters, et cetera. So we've been uh, trying to, now the latest focus here is while we've gone ahead in terms of providing the rural connectivity, we led one of the most important and uh, the biggest rural connectivity program in the world of connecting uh, a lot of habitations as per the 2001 census. 76, so almost 93% of our habitations have got connectivity now by a fair weather road. We have the rural housing scheme going on, which looks at not only entitled, not only housing, but house in the name of women. So the gender and the equity issue has been taken care of. The latest thing that we're talking about is the livelihood mission and which is where our heart and soul lies right now. So we, uh, we are working with uh, about seven crore women in the, uh, in the rural areas, trying to reach out to each and every household with uh, and trying to mobilize these women into federations, the circle groups. It has been a huge success story. The, the success story, the, the story in fact uh, began with mobilizing the community, getting the women together and uh, a little bit of credit and a little bit of thrift activity. Uh, but what we saw was the, the unanimous, the unanimous uh, I would say appetite in women to also access better livelihood options. And this is why now we are looking at rural economic transformation through these women's self-help groups or through these women's collectives. And uh, a lot of work is being done in that area. And this is where we are talking about value chains. We are talking about aggregation. We are talking about enterprises being led by women. And we've had some fantastic stories from the field. Uh, I'll just take a minute over here. This COVID pandemic, in fact, has brought these women federations to the center of this economic development in the villages. So, uh, and, and a lot of things started happening around this time. While the global supply chains broke down, we saw that the local supply chains took over. So while our big uh, supply chains, uh, the Amazons, et cetera, were not able to deliver, but the local supply chains uh, kind of uh, stood on their feet and they were able to supply vegetables, they were able to supply uh, so there was, in a sense, no breakdown of supplies in the rural areas. We in the urban areas were much impacted. So the learning was that there is a potential there. And this potential can be harnessed through intervention of technology, through, through intervention of aggregators, through social enterprises. There's a big role. There is a big space for all of this now currently in the country. I'm just giving you some figures over here. And the figures go like this, that during the pandemic time, our self-help group women, they started getting, they organized themselves. And it was not a mandate that we gave to them, that you have to make masks, face masks, you have to make uh, sanitizers, so on and so forth. But they saw the opportunity for business. And that is how they started, uh, uh, in fact, making these masks. So almost 230 million face masks were produced. So there was about 2,300 US million dollars. They, uh, sorry, not US million dollars, but 2,300 uh, uh, million uh, was the uh, amount that they were able to mobilize through all these uh, uh, productions. 
each and every woman during this phase who was involved in these economic activities were able to garner an income of about 29000 or 30000 to be precise so this brings us to the uh, to the core issue about how do we organize them and when we talk about organizing them it doesn't have to be uh, uh, it has to be around the activities that they do today we don't have to rethink we don't have to think about uh, getting in uh, lots of new technology it is about the production base that they have how well they can be connected to the markets how well can they be connected to the aggregators and how well they can realize their prices now in all of this the rural infrastructure which has been created on has played a very major role so uh, now there are examples that these smaller women so you know public transport is a thing uh, which is uh, lacking currently but the, there have been uh, various models so we have the uh, had these uh, smaller vehicles hybrid vehicles which uh, we gave to the self help group women and these hybrid vehicles were able to carry both freight as well as people to the market otherwise a woman reaching a market is also quite a uh, problematic thing so we had we've got all of these interventions now and uh, and and these aggregators some of the aggregators who have come in they are now able to tell the uh, our producer groups what is the market rate going right now so they don't have to rush to the market don't do the distress selling but they are able to hold back for a certain time now holding back for a certain time so we had this federated structure uh, where self help group women are doing some activity so they are into retail activity at the village level itself then there are these producer groups these are these are the women's collectives and now they are getting organized so you know sorting grading uh the farm gate level processing is happening uh they are able to hire out uh, agriculture equipment so we have the custom hiring center so it's like you know the uberization or the collectivization of these assets which are now being used by our women increasing the productivity and being able to reach the market not that it has happened 100% successfully we are just now beginning and when we begin this task uh there i would like to say government cannot do it singly we would need to join hands both with technology partners both with aggregators with social entrepreneurs who can you know we uh, india as a country is very very rich as far as uh, uh the handicrafts is concerned but handicrafts uh, if it reaches a european market or if it, if it reaches an american market it the the price really goes up but for it to be able to reach and for this handicraft to be something which would be there in the market there we would need interventions so design inputs are required cost how can the cost be reduced how can they uh, courier it how can they package it all those are interventions that now have to be looked at uh, technology in india i mean it's amazing although uh, today itself i was reading reading that 33% is the internet coverage in the rural areas but it is amazing that all our manrega mtn regs is a big big uh, livelihood program i think again the biggest in its size across the world and 100% dbt direct benefit transfer happens right into the account of the beneficiary from the central account so there is nobody in between once the F, the fund transfer order is generated fund goes directly to the district to the beneficiary's account uh, during the pandemic times we transferred some money into the pradhan mantri janthan accounts so these accounts for women accounts holders so uh, uh, and uh, lower in the economic rank rang we were able to transfer this uh, uh, 500 rupees per month every month for 3 years uh, for 3 months we were able to do it so this entire thing about uh, creating a creating an identity which is in the form of aadhar having a, ba- a bank account and having the power of it tools has has really helped so we are now moving to this direct benefit transfer and okay. and alkaji yeah. sorry for interrupting uh could you also little bit touch upon the rural urban mission and... yeah i come to rural urban mission yeah yeah so exactly. it, uh now uh, michael potter i mean he has been speaking about cluster development 
And in fact, very recently, yesterday, I haven't even been able to read the report, but he has now talked about the aspirational district program that we had in India, which was to look at districts which had lowest of socioeconomic indicators. So this was in, in fact, an approach we used for bringing these districts which were at the bottom most rung to almost equivalent uh, level in the, uh, with other districts in the country. Now, Radburn is a form of cluster development model that we've been following. The idea is, so and a village will not grow as much as it will from the synergy derived from a collective of villages, each contributing in some way towards a common activity. So we have these 300 high park clusters, which are seen as the uh, engines of growth. And we most of these uh, are classified on certain economic themes that uh, on the basis of the economic activities which are happening currently. So, uh, and it is, a, it is convergence with other schemes of the government. It is convergence with the local uh, markets with the local, um, I would say, uh, the again, uh, people in the private space, all of these are coming together. And for example, we have some about 20-15% uh, of our clusters which are developing on the tourism theme. Then we have some clusters which are uh, now moving into the agri value chains. So th these clusters are the engines of growth that we see with highest amount of uh, the collectivization happening. We are looking at these centers where which can become the hub of IT activities, also catering not only to this group of five or 10 villages, but then it would have a ripple effect around 50 to 60 villages where everybody then comes onto these clusters. Okay. So I think- uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, if you could wind up so that I, we can move to Hani. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, at this point in time, I just wanted to say it's the strength at the local level, you know, we used to say, think global, but now it is like, think local and build your own value chains. So we, there, there, is a, uh, there is a big shift. I mean, and COVID has probably shown us the way in that regard. And we will definitely need to strengthen our value chains, get in the IT. Uh, we need to look at businesses in the local areas, the micro and the medium sector enterprises in the rural areas, in our clusters, need to bring these industries into the clusters. So today, I just like to uh, an offshoot thing before I just wind up my last statement. So today, I was uh, listening to the news, and it said that Delhi is now going to prohibit any major industry because of the pollution threat that we face every year. It's a very good opportunity again for our urban clusters to offer that space to industries. Because now we are talking about geospatial planning in these clusters. It is not just, you know, bringing. So the idea is to bring the facilities of the city while retain the character of a village. So not overcrowded, make systemic development. So this is the approach that we are using as far as the urban clusters are concerned. Thank you so much, Alkaji, uh, for these insights. Um, I now will move over to Hani uh, at the uh, International Telecommunication Union to give another approach uh, to how they look at smart rural development. Hani, if you could let us know, how does the ITU frame the issue of smart rural areas? Uh, what do you see as the role of enterprises and the private sector in developing uh, these areas? And what are the key objectives and expected outcomes of the Niger Smart Villages project? Hani, over to you. Thank you very much, Tara, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to be uh, among you today. Uh, as mentioned by Tara, um, uh, I work for the International Telecommunication Union, which is the UN specialized agency for uh, telecommunication and for ICT. And really the mandate of our organization is to connect everyone to, to internet. And um, as you probably know, I mean, still, unfortunately, almost half of the world is not connected yet to internet. And this is happening really in rural areas where the level of poverty is high and where the real, real needs are. So rural connectivity, uh, smart uh, rural communities is really one of the main uh, areas that we are really focusing on. 
and um, and currently we are working with many many countries on uh, developing their um, uh, smart villages or smart communities types of initiatives why do we believe in these types of uh, initiatives because um, as we know reaching out to smart uh, to rural areas is quite uh, quite challenging uh, and deploying digital services like for example if you talk about telemedicine or if you talk about uh, e-commerce or you talk about um, uh, uh, digital agriculture advisory T to be able to deploy those types of services in rural areas is uh, is definitely has a cost and uh, and uh, for you know private companies and private entrepreneurs to be able to deploy those types of services on their own it's quite expensive and it's quite daunting and there is no perceived business opportunity so uh, that's why we need to think slightly in a different manner in if we are to you know bring the power of digital um, uh, to rural, uh, rural areas and um, that's why we have developed this concept of smart villages and smart communities and from the name actually here what we are talking about is uh, the unit is the community itself so the, this is a very big change and difference from the previous types of uh, approaches and initiatives where uh, solutions and projects with very much siloed and uh, very much everyone is trying to deploy and scale up its own type of uh, solution like telemedicine uh, or uh, or um, digital learning etc if 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 we keep trying to deploy and invest in siloed solution it will be extremely difficult to scale up that's why we believe uh, that we really need to consider the community as a whole and really try to see how can we invest to bring as much as possible digital services bundled with the connectivity to the community um, for many good reasons. One, because uh, if we are doing this, then we are mutualizing the investment. And we can always think about it as like a carpooling. Instead of each, uh, the, each government ministry or even each entrepreneur going to those villages and trying to make his own investment, it's very different that we use all, all of us the same investment the same platform, the same connectivity, and deploy it as a, as a platform and as a bundle of services, uh, uh, you know, in those two, uh, the rural areas. So I think the the key word here here is really the change of mindset towards this whole of government approach. Uh, our concept is to say let's create a platform where um, we can create these types of reach out to the villages where this platform will be leveraged by everyone, be it government or be it private sector, so that we make one investment that is everyone is using. If we connect a school, for example, so this connectivity will be also used to connect the health center and to deploy digital uh, health services, etc. cetera. And, and we think that without making these types of aggregation, and without taking a multi-sectoral approach, it would be extremely difficult to scale up and really accelerate the digitalization of rural areas. So this requires a real mind change in the mindset of how we approach the investment. Now we need to talk, you know, multi-sectoral, we need to talk partnerships, we need to talk of platforms as opposed to solutions. And really with the whole objective is leaving no one behind. Uh, so that's why we are very much focused in, um, in uh, trying to uh, nurture this type of models uh, of, uh, you know, cross-sectoral type of investment. And, and we always think in terms of portfolio of services or bundling of services. Um, and this applies not only for the aggregation of demand on connectivity, because as it was mentioned by the previous uh, speaker, uh, thinking of, uh, of connecting villages as clusters or to aggregate the demand, this can lower to some extent the cost of the connectivity, but also will lower the cost of the deployment uh, and, and scaling up of those types of services. However, this could not be done unless we have a very good and strong uh, public-private partnership. Uh, I think the government has a role, but also the private sector has a role. Uh, the, the, in the different models we, we, we've been trying to nurture, the, the public usually have the capex type of investment, where uh, they can bring some uh, capital investment to, you know, to, to provide some connectivity to the, um, uh, to the villages, but also, you know, create this digital platform um, uh, whereby you can deploy some generic services.
that can cover different sectors at the same time, like, um, for example, e-learning capabilities or e-commerce capabilities or um, identification and digital identity. So there are some services that could be shared across a number of sectors and where the government can make this investment once but serve different type of services and, uh, and also where the private sector can come and, um, and, and use this shared infrastructure and share the investment to be able to uh, you know, uh, leverage this and reach out to the um, uh, rural communities. Usually the rural communities are not seen as a business opportunity. I, I mean, we all know this type of uh, you know, dilemma that uh, you know, the, 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 there is no uh, perceived business case at the bottom of the pyramid. And I think this is not necessarily very true um, because um, we saw that, for example, rural uh, rural dwellers, even if they have uh, you know very little income, they are still willing to um, you know invest part of this if they really feel that there is a direct benefit or there is a direct impact or there is a direct need. Uh, even it could be simple entertainment. I mean, uh, we saw that people are investing and paying to get access to you know entertainment content or access to even sports and things like that. Um, but also in terms of um, you know, e-commerce, um, we saw that uh, you know, in many cases, um, uh, you know, if, if those services are available for a very small fee, then you can leverage the economies of scale and then you can really being able to build those types of, uh, of services. Bundling of services is extremely important because not all the services that would be required uh, could be uh, you know, leverage by um, uh, on a paid basis. Um, that's why I think being able to aggregate and bundle services where a, a free service could be between quotes uh, funded by a paid service. So, for example, if you talk about agriculture, if you if you have a service for uh, that helps farmers to link to markets, um, this could be could have some fees because this is where the the, the farmer can have access to markets. But at the same time, you can use this income to provide the, uh, the farmers with some additional advisory services, for example, and this will be for free. So these types of uh, cross financing of services can only happen if we really take a more holistic approaches to digital investment and, and we, we really use a shared type of infrastructure and a shared type of uh, investment. Maybe last point I would like to highlight is uh, the issue of um, uh, local community ownership. And I think this had been mentioned uh, from the previous uh, speaker and we see this extremely important for the sustainability of those types of initiatives where we, if you bring some connectivity to, 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 to a rural area and, um, and you would expect or you would work towards creating an ownership from uh, the local villagers and maybe by creating some committees and we see indeed that Committees that have uh, women uh, participation are usually very um, inclusive and, uh, and really make sure that uh, the services that you, you, you try to deploy will be used by everyone in, in the community. So having this sort of uh, local ownership from the community is extremely important uh, for the scaling up uh, of, um, uh, of your services. And again, being able to come together as a consortium or as, a, as an uh, aggregation or as a whole of government approach, uh, this will help, you know, um, uh, honey, services uh, to be deployed together. Honey, honey yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, you, have, uh, you have to uh, wind yeah. up, but if you could speak, please, a little bit about Niger. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Tara. So um, we have started to deploy this types of approaches in Niger. And, uh, and what we have seen is actually that uh, there is a very, um, uh, you know, demand from from the villages. Even in the poorest village, we see that they have, uh, you know, some mobile phones, even basic mobile phones, and even in some cases, smartphones. So I think there is a huge demand, and um, and this reminds me of uh, an application that we developed for um, uh, maternal health, and we started to use it in the health center and uh, immediately afterwards the women when they come to the health center they if uh, if the nurse is not using the tablet they ask why you are not using the tablet i want my my, my son or my baby to be you know put on the tablet uh, so it creates immediately you know this type of um, uh, of uh, interest and demand and trust from the um, from the uh, local communities so i think i think we can uh, really um, uh, hope to 
to be able to uh, immediately create this level of ownership. And, and this is super important, as I mentioned, for the sustainability. And where um, indeed the, 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 the local community will be able to make small investments that could be growing you know, gradually so that they can sustain those types of infrastructure on the long term. Uh, thank you and over to you, Tara. Uh, thank you, Hani. Uh, so we heard from representatives of the government and from the International Telecommunications Union about what's happening in Niger. Very interesting, India at a more advanced application and Niger just starting to build smart villages and a country that is 90% rural. So that means we are developing the whole of Niger by looking at the needs of uh, rural areas. I would like to now switch to, uh, to the issue of uh, what Hani said is that it's very difficult to get capital into rural areas, but we have somebody who is an expert in this and who's doing this very successfully, Noshir uh, um, at Avishkar Capital. Noshir, what are the key uh, issues that holds capital back from rural markets? What are the key financing needs that you find of entrepreneurs in rural markets? You heard from Alkaji, you heard from Hani. Uh, where are the gaps in funding? Uh, what could be, how could you complement the sort of funding that government is putting there with commercial capital? Uh, what are some uh, major investments that you see have, which are successful, not just in terms of profits, but also in terms of generating jobs, especially post COVID? And what do you see are, what are the key things that entrepreneurs need to keep in mind to get financing from venture capital companies um, that are bold uh, enough like you to enter challenging markets. Um, thank you. Over to you, Noshir. Noshir? Um, Tara, I think uh, he might have dropped off because I don't see him in the list, but I think uh, we can go ahead. I'll just yeah, uh, I'll get in touch with him. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know. No worries. Tara, mm. you're on mute. Uh, you, you need to unmute your mic. Yeah, yeah thanks. That's Sorry, thanks for reminding me. Uh, let's move to the private sector um, and the role uh, that they play and the partnerships that they envisage with government and other players. First uh, off the bat, uh, Mr. Prashant Shukla, Managing Director, Udemy. Um, uh, 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 Prashant, in particular, uh, how do we get private sector to be involved in rural areas in a way that goes beyond just um, CSR activities, which are one-off. Uh, Alkaji mentioned um, Michael Porter, who has talked about shared value, which is a more sustainable concept. Given of your, ex you have the unusual experience of having both worked in the public sector, in the, in the railway uh, tele uh, telecom services, and in the private sector, what partnerships are needed to enable such a partnership because as you know, the public sector and the private sector don't speak the same language. What are the key takeaways from your experience of a digital village like Harisal? Um, how is your company, Udemy, helping to close the skills gaps in rural areas and smaller towns? And what do you see as the impact of this on rural employment? Is there a role for a rural entrepreneur in Udemy's uh, business model? Uh, and what sort of partnerships are possible between government and the private sector? Thank you. Over to you, Prashant. Thank you, Taraji. Um, it's a very interesting idea, but let me just set this thought that comes to my mind very quickly. It, it comes from uh, Lord Alfred Tennyson, and it is that uh, the old order change it yielding place to the new. The old order changes yielding place to the new. There are times where we are at inflection points in our history. And I believe this pandemic has actually uh, you know, done a lot of harm for sure, but also opened up new opportunities. What we were thinking earlier was not possible is now very much the norm of the day. 
I'll give you three examples of it and then I'll go into the rural village. So for example, you know, meeting by teleconference, this was not the order of day. This was more an exception and lesser, you know, people used to say when you shake hands only then business can be done. Today it's the norm. We have this, this IntelliCap conference is one such example of it. So meeting. The second is, um, you know, you think- Sorry, uh, Prashanji, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I really apologize. I need to interrupt you because since Noshir has to leave and he's connected, do you mind if we can hold your comments till I come back to you? No, no problem. Okay, Noshir, over to you to talk about uh, capital in rural markets. And I don't know if you missed my question, uh, but you, we've discussed and you have an overall idea of what I wanted to ask. Yeah, Go ahead. sure, sure. Not a problem. And in fact, um, you know, I was very surprised that um, when uh, Madam Upadhyay was talking as, uh, you know, as well as um, Hani, they were talking about things that we at Avishkar have been doing for several years and we want to continue doing. Um, in terms of how the pandemic might have affected uh, rural India, well, as a matter of fact, I happened to be in a village of 40 houses with my family when the lockdown was announced. And we spent the next four and a half to five months over there from uh, March to August. And as Madhav Upadhyay said, the supply chains in rural India did not break down. I mean, we didn't really have a problem getting anything. The day after the prime minister announced that the country would have to shut down, the population of the village doubled overnight. People from the cities poured in because they knew that there's going to be a problem in the cities, whereas in the villages, they would be able to manage somehow or the other. And uh, at that point of time, there was a question mark on everyone's minds that will these people continue to be in the village because they started farming, they started doing things over there, or will they return to the cities? The answer now is that they've all returned to the cities. The village where I was is back to the way it was. Um, 40 houses, about 100, 150 people, and they are back there. And the reason being that there were just no job opportunities. And there is only so much that land can support in terms of labor, right? So where are the opportunities that we at Avishkar have seen, have invested in, and where I see things progressing? The one thing that this pandemic has done is certainly to disrupt the linkages between the villages and rural India and the cities. There is no question about that. And that is an area where we have always identified huge gaps and we have been putting a substantial amount of money into improving those linkages, whether it be linkages in the terms of finance through microfinance, linkages in agricultural inputs, linkages in agricultural outputs, including holding commodities at the village level so that the farmers know that the products are safe and you can just wait till the time is right for them to sell in the market. They can get a 30 or 40% upside on produce if they were to hold it for two months rather than try and sell everything at the time of harvest. Um, so, a lot of agricultural related uh, investment opportunities is where we have seen and where we have put money. Um, the other areas which people have been talking about, but unfortunately have been slow in India, are things like uh, tourism development, etc. Now, just uh, in 2019, last year, I happened to be in a village, a tiny village in Uzbekistan. And GIZ, the German government's uh, agency, had taken it upon itself over the last few years to try and create tourism in this mountainous area, the Nurata Mountains of uh, Uzbekistan, where you've got tiny villages who really don't have much over there except for you know, things like um, walnuts, almonds, etc. There's not much agriculture, there's not much of anything. And they said, why don't we look at doing tourism over here? And they took a cluster approach where they took a number of villages and they sort of got the roads, the Uzbek government to improve the roads a little bit. Um, but more than anything, they brought the knowledge to the villagers there, those who were willing, as to what would it take for a Western, a European tourist to come and stay with them. Their homestays mainly, what would it take? Because 
just as we have the same issue over here, they had it over there, that there are standards of living and they are very, very different across the world. And um, tourism requires a very basic standard to be maintained, right? So how do you do that? There are several, uh, we have not invested in any, but there are several companies in India invested in by investors who are doing something similar, who are going, developing uh, villages, developing homestays and clusters. So tourism is definitely a big area. A third big area that we see is, is um, value add to the local production at the village level. Um, if you look at it, transportation, transportation damage and uh, centralized production is really not the greatest way to go about things. And um, one of the greatest, uh, you know, best examples that I can think of, which has been around for a while in Mahabaleshwar, which is a horticultural area about 200 kilometers south of Bombay. You do have two or three um, brands which have come out of there. I would say not even just the manufacturing facilities who make jams, pickles, preserves, and these are marketed over a very large area. Now, you need to be able to work very closely in each of these clusters to be able to identify what it is that can be produced over there and to what extent will you be able to get local labor, et cetera, to be able to do what is required. You try to go something very sophisticated, you're not going to be able to. But um, if you go with a simple process, um, there are, especially the women are always available or always willing to do that job. Yes, you will have a time during sowing and during harvest where you may not have labor. You've got to factor that in. Right? Um, some of the other areas that um, we have been looking at are on the uh, platform side. Now, Hani did mention a platform, but that was a digital platform. We are currently working through one of our portfolio companies to put together a rural supply platform. Because, you know, wherever you are, whether you are sitting in New Delhi or Mumbai or New York, or you're sitting in a tiny village somewhere, your basic needs are the same. You may not have the same brands, you may not have the same pockets, but the basic needs are the same. And the way we see it is that India has a huge demand right across rural and semi-urban India, the demand is huge, but it is distributed. So if a particular company or a particular brand wants to set up its own distribution network, it's never going to happen. It will never penetrate deep enough. But what if you were to be able to aggregate a number of backend brands who are appropriate for that region? And you then go and set up a supply chain because every village has got its own small uh, retail stores. Some may be 50 square feet, some may be 100 square feet, but they all have village, uh, retail stores. Right? They all have a large village nearby where I mean, these days you can even get mobiles, but you'd have to get the appropriate mobile. So how do you, just as you're trying to you know, reduce the cost of uh, digital connectivity, we are also trying to reduce the cost of physical goods connectivity to the villages and in reverse from the villages back. So if you've got um, vehicles which are running to villages to deliver products, can you utilize that same vehicle to bring products back? And here too, because of COVID to a certain extent, it had all started much before. There are several companies in the cities who want to source directly farm to fork, right? So you tie up with those and you have a reverse logistics also which can be built into it. So there are several innovative models which can be done, especially with connectivity having improved. Yes, it is not the greatest, but I mean, it is pretty good. Um, and technology is such that you could always uh, keep your accounts, et cetera, on the phone. And then when you reach uh, a, a place which has connectivity, you could upload, download whatever has to be done. So there are a lot of different opportunities which are out there. And um, we do believe that at the end of the day, private capital is the only way that you're going to be able to really make a difference in these areas because there's only so much that um, grants can do. There's only so much that government uh, projects can do. They can validate um, concepts. 
they could maybe carry out a pilot for private for for uh, the private sector. Um, but at the end of the day, large amounts of capital can only come from the private sector, and we have to be able to figure out ways and means of directing that capital to where it is most needed, and to the segments of society and to the genders where it is most needed. And that is the approach that we are taking at Amishka. Nasheed, can you talk a little bit about what you look for in terms of entrepreneurs that are who are who have ideas that are fundable? Um, sure. So I'll give. I mean, so at Avishka, we specialize in taking ideas. Entrepreneurs come to us with ideas, and we work with them to develop those ideas into investable opportunities. Um, one of our most successful companies, which today has raised. Um, several tens of millions of dollars. It's uh, going to reach $100 million in fundraise very soon. Was when two brothers walked into our office and said, look, we have seen this gap in the agricultural supply chain where there are three or four intermediaries between the manufacturer and the farmer. And the farmer is never sure whether he or she is getting um, and adulterated products, or whether they're getting uh, the authentic products in terms of seeds, which is very, very critical because there's a lot of spurious stuff floating around the market. We believe that we can bridge this by tying up with um, the manufacturers at the back end and doing direct marketing over the phone using SMS and WhatsApp marketing to the farmers. And this was back in 2013, if I remember correctly. And at that point of time, the thought of being able to market to farmers using SMSs and WhatsApp and to be able to set up essentially an Amazon or a Flipkart for farmers was very, very far-fetched. Like, will farmers trust people that they've never seen? Will they buy from people they've never seen? You know, how do you do it? Well, today, that company is one of the top companies in the country. Um, it's got revenues of hundreds of crores of rupees and that that model has been validated. Right? So if there are ideas, the entrepreneurs who have those ideas need to find the right kind of investors to back them. And it's never going to be easy. This company has had also had to go through pivots. But if there is a large enough market and if there is meat behind that idea that there is something there and it's only a matter of how do you achieve it, um, there is no reason why um, private equity would not eventually flow into it. You would have to de-risk the model. Once the model is de-risked, there is lots and lots of money to follow. Thank you, Noshir. Uh, very interesting for our audience of entrepreneurs to know what would it take to get capital interested in their ideas. Have innovative ideas approached the right uh, fund providers uh, like Avishkar Capital and others who are in the market? If there is a profit to be made, capital will flow. You just need to look at the right models. Thank you, Noshir. And going back to our private sector uh, panelists, uh, Prashant G, you were very eloquently quoting Tennyson. So just to refresh the questions to you on how can we go beyond CSR initiatives for the private sector to be involved? Uh, how do you bring public and private together to work in a meaningful, sustainable way, takeaways from Harisal. And um, how is Udemy, uh, what is you, how and what is Udemy doing to close the rural skills uh, gap? Thank you. Over to you, Prashanti. So, um, as I was pointing out, you know, the, this, the, the pandemic is, has been bad in some ways, but it's also been good in some other ways because it has brought us to that inflection point where it, this change in be, is being forced in us in a very speedy way. So coming back to our experience with Harisal, one of the things that we did in this model was when we first went there, forget internet connectivity, forget uh, digital economy, they did not even have a phone connectivity. Regular phones did not work. So it was at that point of time that we decided that this would be a great place because if we could do it in Harisal, then it could happen everywhere. And Michael um, Gingold, who's going to speak later, I had roped him in 
gotten him in 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 bringing about the internet connectivity but our vision was very simple our vision was to look at four or five key pillars and bring those together and therein lies the template that can be applied to many other places so what was that it was about bringing together first of all is livelihoods how do you raise the income of the people without that nothing will happen because that will eventually you know get people involved the second part was education third was healthcare fourth was infrastructure um the good news is the infrastructure is now being developed it's all the connectivity is happening already i think what the three or four areas where you know private sector can come in beyond csr and it's important to emphasize that because if you look at large number csr is only 2% of what the private sector does i mean at best so that is not the csr model is a good first step it's not going to change the rural india there has to be a clear financial method or a financial justification for private sector to come in and invest and there is actually money out there there is fortune at the bottom of the pyramid as ck prahlad used to say coming back to this one one of the one of the things that uh, you know education can do but particularly digital education which is where udemy is in today we have seen a huge spur in growth in, in these uh, pandemic times uh, you know 30 to 40% more compared to normal times so that's the first one <coughs> the second one is you know new models think global but build local so in this uh, you know demand driven agricultural supply um in the old days you had this issue of uh, you know burst and 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 booms um uh, onion is very uh, is either selling for 3 rupees or 5 rupees per kilo or 100 rupees per kilo so it, you know this the, if you change it with new ideas which is a demand driven agricultural supply if you told the farmers ahead of time that look from years of technical research we know that the general demand will be in this region um if you were to instead of growing excess if you were to you know control the supply compared to what what will be consumed so much more efficient again this is an example of think global but build local the third part of it is healthcare and medicine uh, that that's that's a huge opportunity today most of rural india is uh, you know unconnected uh, but as the internet spreads what about new models for you know both uh, keeping people healthy and bringing new technologies such as uh, telemedicine uh, you know to to bring together this ecosystem and the final part is in my opinion the 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 way you will finance it no finance will follow uh, unlimited uh, you know uh, unlimited drains they must see uh, a return on capital for it to go their new areas such as uh, uh, products that are coming from rural india but have a financial uh a uh, financial uh, you know model so in harisal for example a lot of local entrepreneurs uh, used uh, bamboo as one of the products there they started doing uh, bamboo based products and started sourcing it out uh, honey from rural from that part of the world to other area so these are new products that are there that would have uh, demand but there needs to be a path to it and that path uh needs to be you know financially viable the final final point the rule that uh, the role that the government can play in this i believe there must be some interesting templates that which should be thought of at global level and by global level i mean you know uh thinking of models of you know excellence that could be brought about there the soul of that cluster uh, that you know mahani and uh, nashir were talking about the soul of that cluster has to be recognized what would that cluster as a whole do and not think village by village so the soul of that cluster has to be recognized and and the models that need to be built have to be around that so with that you know i think uh, this post pandemic will surprise us 
on the other side of it, I'm an eternal optimist. So I believe that the, the worst is, you know, past. Uh, there are new things that are happening. The economy is recovering. And if anything, we will come back better. We will build stronger. And we will see new models emerging out of this. What was not thought of yesterday will now be the norm in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you, Prashanti. Uh, very uh, apt uh, what you said that the old order is changing right before our eyes and people are really adapting to the new order very fast, much faster than we anticipated. Um, now, next, uh, we will we switch to a real social entrepreneur among the panelists, uh, Michael Gingold, um, uh, who is, uh, you know, Mike, Michael is talking about excellence in digital connectivity for rural areas. Uh, Michael, what are, uh, you know, the key challenges to bring uh, rural connectivity, uh, which is a foundation for the application for technology and innovation? and also for entrepreneurship in this uh, age that is, you know, you need to be connected to the digital and to the global economy. Uh, how can partnerships with other private sector players, you are an ISP, how do you partner with others, bigger players in this uh, field? How can government support the growth of a social entrepreneur like you? And, you know, digital connectivity is the first step, but digital skills and usage are also key to digital transformation. Uh, what are, what do you see as the primary uses of internet in rural areas? What are people asking for, especially post COVID-19? And what has been the impact of 10 years of air um, supporting rural connectivity? What do you need more to scale up bigger and faster? Thank you, over to you, Michael. Sure. Uh, thanks. And uh, hi, everybody. Good evening, India time. Um, to follow up on uh, Prashant, whose uh, real vocation, I think, should be a motivational uh, speaker is, is always a hard task. But uh, as uh, um, Newton said, I could see far because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. So Prashant, I'll be standing on your shoulders as I uh, try to field the, the number of questions that you put my way, um, Tara. So um, let's start with the, with, with the challenges. Um, you always need to start with the challenges in some ways. And, and the challenges are really here are really simple. When it doesn't matter what we do in rural areas, really, um, whether it's, it's uh, telemedicine or agriculture or uh, marketing or uh, education. Um, you're really trying to bring uh, products uh, which you want uh, ideally to be at the same uh, quality level that you provide elsewhere, be it in, in an urban area or in another country, uh, to a place that is uh, uh, rural by definition. And that means that it's uh, more sparsely populated uh, by people who have less ability to pay. And it's going to cost you more to deliver the same product. Um, so, so there's always a, there's almost a sort of an inherent mismatch here and you need to overcome it. And, and the way to overcome it again, uh, um, standing on the shoulders of, of another giant, uh, uh, Warren Buffett, who, you know, before the great collapse of uh, uh, the bubble in, in, in the US, uh, when asked when he, why he refuses to, to, to uh, uh, put money into various uh, uh, startups that had wonderful names and very little behind, he said, look, I, I, I uh, studied traditional economics and I believe in traditional economics. You know, there's supply, there is demand, there is cost and there is return. And, and I subscribe to that. So, so the challenges that you face as anyone doing operations in rural areas is to try and square that circle. And uh, in Air Jaldi, um, the way we do it, again, really, really simple. We try to uh, be judicious with the costs and uh, we try to uh, uh, provide a quality uh, service for which we can charge uh, um, a price that allows us to, um, first of all, uh, 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 cover a cost, but then have, as many people just pointed out, a return on the investment. Um, by no means a, a, a mean a fit. Uh, um, and uh, we've been doing it uh, for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, by the way, Tara, in nine Indian states, not seven, um, and continue to do so. And indeed, Harisal was one of the, uh, and is still one of the areas where we work. 
Um, so, you know, let's, I'll, I'll try and quickly respond to the question. You know, the key, the key growth drivers at the moment in, in rural India, in rural India, pandemic or no pandemic are really, um, again, no great surprises here. Um, you know, we provide connectivity as uh, uh, our main product. Um, it's uh, connectivity and connectivity related services. So the first order of demand is, is social media. Whether it's 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 uh, for private usage or for entrepreneurial and enterprise uh, use, <clears throat> this is followed by, of course, entertainment in various forms. Um, that's a, a major part of of what people consume, and then it follows with with two things that are uh, indeed, as people pointed out, uh, sort of very very exciting uh, uh, new sprouts coming on. The heels of the pandemic, which I joined Prashant in wishing uh, it to go away as soon as possible. And these are digital education. Uh, people have uh, time in their hands and they have connectivity in their hands uh, if, if Air Jaldi or someone else is there. And, and the combination of those two is, is not, not least, uh, is not nothing less than explosive uh, in, a, in a positive sense. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, work from home. And Nushir was mentioning that, uh, and we've seen this uh, uh, in many, many areas where we work. Uh, people have moved back to where they came from um, and people work and continue to work from home. There is uh, already, we see the, the movement in the opposite direction, people return home, but uh, in, in many cases, connectivity remains behind. Uh, for the household members who stayed behind, and possibly for those who actually found a way to continue to work uh, 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 from home, which is uh, um, always a, a good thing if you can manage it and you like rural areas uh, like I do. Um, that leads me to the, to the second question, Tara. What, is, what about uh, a, a partnership with other private sector uh, uh, players? So our main, our main partners uh, uh, are, are really uh, two or three uh, 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 segments. The first is, is similar organizations to ours who deal with in one way or the other in supply and sourcing of, of connectivity. There are many providers across India that have you know, commitment to provide connectivity to financial inclusion institutions, to factories, to showrooms all across the country. Um, they don't always have the, the reach all across the country. Um, and then they turn out to organizations like us, in particular in rural areas to extend uh, their own reach. The same holds for institutions that work in multiple locations. And again, this could be a financial inclusion uh, enterprise that has uh, 30 branches or 50 branches in a particular uh, state, needs connectivity, outsources it to us and, and we uh, provide it in bulk. The third segment is, is of course, uh, private businesses um, uh, that, that see connectivity. And, and the common thing for all of these, uh, uh, these three is really that uh, internet, you know, the minute, the minute internet starts to be something that is not uh, uh, provided close, very, very close to 24 seven, every minute of, of the 24 seven almost with a certain le minimum level of stability, it, it moves very, very fast to becoming a telegraph service and not an internet service. And, and in this day and age, um, the, the, the equivalent of, of a telegraph internet that you, know, you can just use for email, for example, is just not good enough anymore. Um, so, so our partnerships are really, really based on, on our ability to provide this service. And, and when I say to provide this service, um, it, it really isn't just providing uh, the speed that you want. It's providing the service that you want. Because uh, one thing that we have to realize about working in rural areas, it's challenging and the challenges won't go away, no matter how good you are. Um, and the question is, when things go wrong, how fast can you rectify them? And how far are you away from a troubleshoot? And that's something that we put a lot of emphasis on. Um, in terms of, of government support, um, we personally, as a company, um, did never had much of, of government support. Uh, um, there's been uh, representatives here from the Ministry of Rural Development, and they, and they spoke. And, and of course, there's huge. Uh, 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 there are huge programs taking place in, in rural areas, and the same holds for connectivity. Uh, but by and large, um, these government schemes uh, do not uh, find their way or, or, or find the, the private sector as a channel of, of, of uh, implementation. Uh, there are many reasons for it and, and we don't have the time to deal with them uh, here. Um, 
I, I want to kind of follow up on, on digital skills and digital connectivity, which, which again, Prashant uh, 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 spoke about. And, and I think, again, this is a very, very promising uh, area, but we need to think about two, two things here. One is that connectivity as an in of itself is, is a, a, um, a definitely a necessary condition, but far from sufficient. And even when you have stable connectivity and you bring good content, even that is, is, is still a necessary, but an insufficient condition. Because the expectation that we can bring some, any kind of intervention to a rural area without offering technical support uh, to help this service to continue is, uh, uh, um, pun intended, a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, water won't flow through broken pipes. Uh, connectivity won't flow through, through cut fibers. And uh, uh, um, an application won't go uh, um, um, and be used if the computer that is used to, to, to run it is broken down. Um, so we always need to think about those things. And this is something that we as, as their jolly uh, concern ourselves with as part of, um, of uh, our, our future uh, uh, direction of development. Um, when, when we talk about the, the, the impact of, of, of Air Jali, that's, that's, that's a very hard one. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't like to sound anecdotal. And on the other hand, I don't have the statistics to back up uh, some of the claims that I'll be making. But, but generally speaking, um, I touched upon what I think is the most important uh, aspect of what we do, which is provision of stable uh, uh, internet services. And when it's not stable, providing services to support that. Um, research all over the world has shown that that quality of service um, is probably the biggest uh, 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 sticking point for, for customers in rural areas and in urban areas across the world. So it's not a speed game, it's a service game. Um, in, in terms of going forward and what it is that we need, um, and with this I'll end and I think my time is running out also. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we first of all... <laughs> In, in, in order to continue and, and, and expand and continue and do more of what we, what we do, uh, it's a really, really simple thing. We need additional finance, which we are working on. In terms of, of uh, um, things that are not financial and, and relate to government policies, um, I think uh, uh, there is uh, uh, much that the government can do and there's much that the government should not do. And, and in, in terms of what it can do, and this is something that Prashant and I uh, were working on together in, in Prashant's previous incarnation. Um, there are many, many ways of bringing connectivity. And in India, we are using but a few tools of the available tools in the toolbox. Um, there are many radio frequencies that could be released for, for, for usage in rural areas and could greatly and very, very quickly um, improve on the status of connectivity in rural areas. And uh, I really hope that the government will um, uh, move in the right direction as far as I'm concerned in that. The second thing is, is government for me does not need to be an entity that actually executes program. Government needs to support the execution of programs. Um, and this is a sort of a basic of, of, of a public service. Uh, be, be the pursuer of outcomes rather than the provider of, of inputs and outputs. Um, and with that, uh, I think I can, I can stop. Thanks. Uh Sorry, Zara, you're on mute. Muting now. I'm yeah. Hi. Um, uh, I want to move quickly to Jahum waiting uh, patiently in Seoul. Um, Jahum, uh, from your perspective, uh, right now where you sit at Samsung, what do you think are the technologies that are relevant for rural transformation? Uh, the current ones and the future ones because I know Samsung SDS works on many uh, emerging technologies. Um, how important are rural markets for Samsung? What sort of partnerships would you have with you know, smaller private sector companies to be able to roll out some of your solutions and with the public? Uh, what are the key learnings from your time in uh, KT, Korea Telecom? on uh, supporting uh, interventions in rural areas. Um, uh, thank you. Over to you, Jahong. Uh, so th thank you. Thank you very much um, for the introduction and the questions, um, Tara. I would like to thank everybody uh, on the panel. It would be it's a shame that we couldn't meet face to face, but it's the global epidemic, so it's the new normal. Um, so 
Um, I'll just try to maybe address and answer some of the, the questions raised, uh, maybe tackle one by one. So what are some of the technologies relevant for the uh, rural transformation? Well, um, although I work for Samsung SDS, um, I also, I, I've been very fortunate to be on IT Development Bureau study group, question 5.1, uh, which actually primarily discusses the use of telecommunications and ICT in rural and remote areas. And uh, so although we have Hani, who is also a very an expert uh, with this area, uh, the study looked at various ICT solutions in rural settings and uh, in many different countries for many decades uh, from all IT member states. And I, I think the conclusion uh, is still the basic uh, technologies that we all, always have known and we always hear about. So, for example, like uh, the fiber optic cables, the copper cables, the coaxials, the submarine cables for the fixed. Uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G for the, for the wireless, Wi-Fi, fixed wireless access, satellite technologies. And so these are very basic technologies that we all know about. Um, they're basically the infrastructure, um, I guess, technologies. But I think as we come to the, the COVID-19 outbreak, I think this has become more important, actually having a basic ICT infrastructure, even in the rural area, uh, for example, for Korea has certainly helped us um, to actually uh, reduce some of the infections that uh, have come from the, the COVID-19. Um, so uh, I think that the IT study actually shows that technologies evolve over time and are replaced continuously by new ones, but there is no one size fits all. Um, different regions, different countries, different rural settings have their uh, different needs, I guess, um, and they adopt different technologies. So um, for Samsung, I think one of the, the technologies that we um, implemented uh, recently uh, in rural Korea is actually uh, uh, the LTE uh, marine technology. So uh, basically, Korea has um, islands scattered uh, near the, the mainland uh, within the 100 mile um, uh, distance. And uh, actually, the, the, the beam forming actually from the mainland to the island actually covers most of the remote and rural areas in, in Korea. So that was one of the technologies that um, we used in the rural areas. And also, uh, we also used, uh, for example, the 5G technology in 2018 during the, uh, the PyeongChang Winter Olympic Games. So um, a lot of the performances were using that. And PyeongChang, the host city itself, is, very, is located in a very um, rural mountainous area. So that's uh, some of the experiences um, that we've had with um, deploying technology there. And uh, for the rural markets for Samsung, well, I, I actually, I, I work for Samsung SDS, so I can't really speak on behalf of the whole Samsung group because all the Samsung companies, they have different um, sections within the companies. So we have electronics, we have SDS, and we have other, other Samsung companies. But if we look at the rural population, I think um, a lot of the data from, from the UN, the World Bank shows that the rural population is continuously declining in most of the continents. But, if we look at some of the reports from ITU and GSMA, 49% uh, of that world population is still unconnected. And most of this, those, this, this connection is in the rural areas. So um, as all, most of those uh, focuses or has been on urban areas, I think that focus will be shifting to rural areas um, in, so, in some matter. And, and the market size, I guess, is still sizable, I guess, in those rural areas. But for Samsung, I think, um, Starting as a Korean company, uh, although we have a lot of presence across many countries, I think when we look at um, different countries and different rural markets in different countries, we really can't do this um, by ourselves. We, we need uh, the partnerships with local players, uh, partnering with governments, local companies. And I think that is uh, very important. Uh, I don't think we can replicate all the success from Korea to other countries. So although we take part of those successes to some of the countries, uh, we actually uh, do need to invent those in the local context with partnerships from all levels, um, I think, especially when it comes to rural areas. Um, some of the questions, another question that was, um, that Tara, you asked was on the Samsung Smart School projects. Yes. Um, how they are actually going. So um, I've only recently joined from Korea Telecom to Samsung, but uh, just to provide a basic um, background, the Samsung Smart School, which began in 2012, um, is actually, uh, was actually made to reduce the, the, the digital education gap in a lot of the countries. So 
um, 140 smart schools in Korea, uh, more than 3,000 smart schools across the world. Uh, but uh, it's basically using Samsung products, Samsung technologies, technologies to reduce um, those digital gaps. But they are only in some parts of the areas. They don't really cover much, I guess. Um, I think uh, Bashar mentioned earlier on that such CSR projects rarely cover much uh, of the rural area coverage. But for us, it's actually a starting point. It's, it's a, a point of interaction. Um, it's a way of actually working with governments and private sectors in the country uh, because we are, we are from Korea and that kind of helps us to initiate uh, and engage with those um, players. And uh, for, for the future plans, I believe uh, due to the COVID-19, the, the schedules for next year is actually on hold. So I think um, Samsung Electronics will be actually um, trying to reinvent and maybe uh, try to see what um, will happen next year and is still under the planning stage for that. Now for the last question, I think um, it's the experience with uh, the smart villages in Bangladesh um, while I was at KT. So what are the key um, success factors for the sustainable smart rural interventions? Um, as I mentioned before, I think it's, I think the single answer is really partnership. So um, I think partnerships where everyone um, has their unique strength and sense of camaraderie of working together. So uh, a certain chemistry, uh, the Koreans love to use the, the term synergy. Um, it's in every CEO's um, dictionary, but I believe, um, I believe that is why we are all here to learn from each other and to build potential partnerships uh, in the summit. So prior to joining Samsung, I, I worked on uh, one of the uh, projects by Korea Telecom. It was a, a, the Giga Island project. It's basically very similar to the Smart Village project. Uh, it took place in a uh, remote island, Washkali Island in Bangladesh. So in the east of Bengal near um, Cox's Bazaar. And the project was basically to connect the island via network technologies, um, connect the people uh, with uh, using ICTs and different ICT solutions applications um, because KT had solutions such as energy, safety, healthcare and education solutions. So they were all bundled and used, but uh, it was a partnership. So it was a public private partnership. So Korea Telecom basically provided the network technologies and the solutions and the technical people to build it, to the infrastructure on the island uh, and connect it to the main island um, and also connect the schools and the uh, government offices as well. And also Korea Telecom at the time built, a uh, built an IT education center inside the community center. So they also built storage rooms and they built an e-commerce platform in the center and uh, they tried to provide um, equipment such as laptops and power units and um, health healthcare um, equipments as well. Um, and also the Bangladesh government uh, was there. They provided uh, through BTCL, which is the uh, Bangladesh Telecommunication Company Limited. They provided the backhaul network that actually connected uh, the towers and the, and the access networks in the island. And also they provided um, with the educational contents that the government had already um, developed uh, in the past projects. Um, there was the International Organization for Migration, which is a UN agency, IOM, and they actually provided with the communication between all stakeholders. They provided their local staffs in the Hoxas Bazaar, uh, Bazaar region. And what um, they were very important because um, they would actually uh, carry on the project after Katie left in the project. So. There was, a, there was a transition period where all uh, the training was uh, carried out between KT and IOM. And one lesson that we took was that um, the, the past projects had never done a monitoring and evaluation um, inside the project. So this we learned actually from, from IOM and we were able to try to monitor the processes and to see if the, the, the successes were measured and the results, uh, and the results were measured. And I think this was a big lesson for Korea Telecom um, at the time. And uh, lastly, the, the NGO, um, the Jago Foundation in Bangladesh, also an e-commerce company called um, Amardash Amaragam. They actually, we worked together to sell the products from the Moishkali Island uh, via the e-commerce platform to Dhaka. So the people in Dhaka could actually access the, the network to see uh, what fish they could actually buy and the fish would be transported 
uh, within 24 hours from, from the island to uh, the capital city. So um, I think just lastly to comment, I think um, uh, it would have been difficult for Katie to do this all alone. And I think it's the partnerships and the synergies um, between uh, those different stakeholders that actually made the success and maybe uh, to make the project more sustainable. Thank you, uh, Jia Hong. Uh, great to know that uh, companies of the size of Korea Telecom and Samsung do partner with local entrepreneurs. I would like to give the last word, uh, uh, one minute to Alka Ji to talk about whether she sees from the government's perspective relevance for such partnerships and to have a platform that can bring a private sector, the government, and investors together to redesign uh, rural spaces. Alkaji, over to you uh, yeah, so, uh, in, in a short time. Yeah, so it was all very heartening to know the kind of inroads that these agencies are making. And like I said before, government can't walk it all alone now. And uh, the way we see it now, whether be it technology, whether be it value chain, whether be it any kind of economic development, we will have to partner with the private organizations who come in with some amount of uh, capital, which is easy to access by our self-help groups. I know nobody, I mean, we just can't be looking at uh, grants and aids, but th there has to be capital at cheaper price, easily available. And also they have to play the role of improving the production systems, the productivity and making market access a whole lot easier. So I'm sure we, there are lots and lots of things in which we need to partner and we will have to partner if uh, the development in rural areas is to be taken ahead. Thank you, Alkaji. Hani, the same question to you for the last words. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Tara. I think it's uh, again obvious that uh, you know no no one no one agency can do that uh, alone, and it's all about bringing the different pieces together, and it's all about tapping into uh, you know uh, uh, finding the right uh, cost efficiency models and economies of scale, so we can you know expand and scale up quickly. So I think. Uh, I think this type of forum is is very good because it really brings all the different uh, you know partners together. And uh, our hope and our uh, you know call is really to try to replicate those types of forum at the country level, because this is how things can move. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we are out of time. To quickly summing up, just with some terms that we heard over and over again: the importance of rural transformation, the importance of partnerships of government, the private sector, and somebody, and both Alkaji and Prashanji both said, uh, uh, you know, think local, uh, but also plan for global. Uh, and uh, we also see there is, I think one good thing this pandemic has done is people have realized the value of rural areas. In countries where I am sitting, the developed countries, people are moving to rural areas because they feel it's cleaner you have good nutrition. After all, immunity is the only thing that's protecting you against the pandemic. And so let's build on that together and let's keep having this conversation. This was just the first of a long series of conversations that we need to have. Thank you everybody from uh, Seoul to Seattle for joining us and all the people who are listening in. Uh, I was seeing the questions, I did try to weave them in. So I think we did address most of the questions and I could see Michael was getting business over the chat function. Thank you and see you and keep uh, thinking locally and acting globally and uh, carrying on this rural transformation. Thank you and goodbye signing off from Washington uh, DC. Thank you to the organizers and everybody who helped me. Bye everyone.